Welcome everybody to the uh, resumed series uh, of uh, speakers and uh, seminars at the African Studies Program at SAIS. Uh, today's event is entitled The Congo's Botched Election, Where Do We Go From Here? Uh, doesn't leave a lo yeah doesn't leave a lot to the imagination in terms of some of the uh, assumptions that we bring to the discussion today, uh, but we are very pleased to be able to uh, lead our uh, spring series uh, with this uh, event, and uh, we're very grateful to our three speakers, uh, Mvemba Dizzelelli, Jason Stearns, and Anthony Gambino. Uh, Tony Gambino for uh, uh, agreeing to join us here uh, today. Um, as is well known, the Congolese elections of uh, November 28th were shadowed by a great many problems. Uh, there was disarray in the voting process. There were large questions about the integrity of the numbers and the count. There was violence and contested results uh, in the aftermath, leaving uh, very uncertain the prospects for uh, the, uh, the current government and uh, Congo's political stability going forward. Uh, and here with us today uh, to discuss the elections and the overall political context are three specialists who are uh, well known to the audience probably, uh, certainly uh, they have been uh, active participants and discussants in previous events on uh, DRC that we've hosted uh, and are well known uh, within the Africanist and the policy communities uh, as specialists on Congolese politics. And Vemba Dizalele uh, is uh, an adjunct uh, professor at SAIS, a fellow at the Hoover Institution, and a well-known writer and foreign policy analyst and independent journalist. Uh, currently working on a major biography of Mobutu, uh, The Rise and Fall of the Leopard King, which we uh, anticipate soon. Uh, Jason Stearns has been working on uh, conflict in the Democratic Republic of the Congo for uh, more than a decade uh, with the United Nations, with uh, Hertiers de la Justice, uh, and other organizations, as well as uh, working with uh, MONUC and MONUSCO, the International Crisis Group, and he is well known as the author of the recent Dancing in the Glory of Monsters, which I recommend as uh, one of the most accessible and uh, uh, incisive uh, of the recent books on uh, DRC and the conflict in the Great Lakes area, and currently uh, also in the Political Science Department uh, at Yale University. Tony Gambino served as the director of USAID uh, in DRC uh, some few years ago uh, and has remained a specialist on political and conflict and development issues in the Great Lakes region. Uh, he's worked uh, from 1997 to 2004 for USAID and he has also testified uh, and collaborated with uh, the House of Representatives, the State Department, uh, and other nonprofit organizations, and is currently affiliated with the Eastern Congo Initiative. Um, before we uh, start, and we'll lead off with Mvemba, followed by Jason Stearns and then uh, Tony Gambino, I just want to flag uh, some of our upcoming events. Uh, today we're talking about DRC. Next week we're going to uh, present uh, a, a speaker, a seminar on why repeated elections don't always lead to better democracy, the case of Cote d'Ivoire and the need for stronger institutions with Maja Vobkan from the University of Oxford. On March 7th, uh, we're going to be discussing uh, corruption and reform in Nigeria's oil sector, particularly the issue of subsidies with Alexandra Gillis from Revenue Watch and we hope uh, a major Nigerian representative uh, David Booth and uh, David Hanley will be here on March 12th uh, presenting findings from uh, the project's Tracking Development and African Power and Politics Program, two broadly uh, comparative projects looking at the politics of development in Africa and in cross-regional perspective. And on March 14th, uh, Colin Waugh 
will launch his book, Charles Taylor in Liberia, Ambition and Atrocity in Africa's Lone Star State. So uh, you can find those events listed on our program website, and they will also be updated in the uh, general SICE events calendar, and they are open to the public. Generally speaking, uh, our events for uh, these other topics will be held across the street in the Bernstein Offit building and not here in uh, Kenny, but because of the interest in this topic, we uh, booked a bigger room. Also, I will flag our conference on May 1st and 2nd, the New African Democracy, Information Technology and Political Participation, uh, which will be here and which I uh, commend to everyone. So without any further delay, let me uh, turn the floor over to Mvemba and uh, probably we can just speak from the table um, and uh, Jason can either speak from the table or the podium, whatever is more convenient. Oh, you've got the clicker? Perfect, okay. Uh, thank you, Peter, for the introduction and uh, thank you for the invitation. I think the DRC remains uh, a priority even though it doesn't always feel that way when you read the news. Um, but we have a country that you can look at the map, which is the size of Western Europe, um, where people have suffered for a long time and finally had an opportunity to say their voice to, uh, by way of ballot. And uh, now it feels that uh, that voice has not been recognized. It's even much more troubling that uh, at this point, the international community seems to be asking more violence of the Congolese so that they can see that, in fact, there is political mobilization. Uh, and I think that's a sad state of affairs when we come to a point that the international community is asking of people to show more violence so they can actually believe that these people want change. Um, so what I'll do for my few minutes is kind of give the background to the crisis. And I think in order for us to understand uh, where we are today, we have to look, to go back and look at um, what happened before the 2006 election because the crisis goes as far as that. So in 2000, 2003, uh, 2002, end of 2002, uh, the various warring factions in the DRC uh, met in South Africa to what they call the Dialogue Inter-Congolais, where they were trying to come together. The country had been split in about three parts, one controlled by the MLC of Jean-Pierre Bemba, uh, one controlled by the RCD, which was Rwanda backed, and the rest controlled by the uh, weak government of Kinshasa. Through those uh, negotiations, they agreed that they will have a government of national unity with one president and four vice presidents, which was known to the Congolese as one plus four equals zero. Because in reality, what had happened was you had former militia leaders in government. They had guns. They threatened to, to pull out any time. They split the country in four, what the Congolese call uh, partage vertical. So all the embassies, all the parastatals, all the ministries were split among those four uh, warring factions. Plus, I mean, there was this, a civil society element which was very weak, of course, couldn't really say anything. So you can imagine when a country's embassy, embassies are staffed by various parties with different agen agendas, what happens? So you really have no diplomacy, no united voice. But the one thing that was good of that system was that within two years, they were supposed to organize elections. Eventually they did, so in 2006, the Congolese went to the elections. Um, 33 candidates. It was then said that Kabila was the favorite to win. Uh, those of us who were on the ground didn't quite believe that, but the international community believed that Kabila was favored to win. They wanted him to win. Uh, the international press said Kabila was favored to win. They wanted him to win. Um, you know, the international press and the diplomatic corps often echo each other, so you're not getting much uh, variance there. But the country went to the elections, and uh, Kabila did not win the first time. Uh, surprised everybody, and forced, uh, so the opposition forced a runoff. Uh, some scuffle, violent scuffle took place in Kinshasa, but overall, the fact that they went to a second round was very good for Kabila, even though at the time I don't think he saw it that way because it legitimized him in a way that you couldn't deny. That, okay, we had two rounds of election, now what? So Kabila emerged as the winner and with a lot of hope that the country now will get on track and will move forward. Five years later, 
the country didn't get on track. We did not move forward. So the 2011 was supposed to be the consolidation of the gains from 2006. So to give you a sense of what happened, I remember I was with the uh, Carter Center Observation Mission. So when we landed uh, in November, as we left in Chile, all we saw, all the billboards, literally as you leave the airport, were Kabila, 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 into town. And this Austrian guy was sitting next to me and I'd observe, he said, is there any other candidate <laughs> in, in this? Um, because they, you felt like, you felt all, as if there was no other candidate. I saw one billboard of Chisekedis the entire time I was there. I take a lot of pictures and that's the only one I could take. It was not even of him. It was of a candidate of UDPS who put Chisekedis pictures in the background. Um, so, but what went wrong? What went wrong was that the, for some reason, the Kabila government didn't feel like they need to prepare the elections. You know, often you hear that they say in Africa, he who organizes the election wins them. That's great, but you should organize them so at least you win them. Um, the Kabila government did not do that. They waited until 2011 to actually set up or appoint the Independent Na National Electoral Commission. So in March, they appointed them. Uh, in, in February, they appointed them. In March, they became operational with the mission to organize the election in November. If you look at the map and the size of Congo without viable infrastructure, how do you organize the election within nine months? Uh, it's impossible. Uh, Tony and I had written, I uh, wrote a paper back in uh, October where we had called for all these deficiencies, called out all these deficiencies, and it became very clear that Congo needed more time to organize the elections. So that's kind of the logistical and political side. Then there was a problem with uh, the government again because the government decided uh, through the majority of the president in parliament to change the constitution. They changed the constitution in January of 2011, the year of the election. They had four year, four, five years to do this, but they chose to do it right as we were nearing the elections. And so people ask, why did they change the constitution? The constitution, the, the, main, the main thing that they changed, which was important to the election, was scrapping the two round the two-round electoral process to one round. The reason at the time, the official reason was it's gonna be costly, we cannot afford this, and therefore we have to change it so it's gonna be. But my reason, or the reason for all of us who followed the situation there is that up to that point, up to December 2010, the field looked pretty good for Kabila. His main opponent, which Jean-Pierre Bemba, who challenged him in 2006, had been arrested, was sitting at The Hague, for crimes that his troops committed in the Central African Republic. Uh, there was nobody. In Congo, you need money. If you need to run, you need money. You need more than just a name. So there was nobody in sight. Chisekedi had been sick, uh, seeking treatment in Europe. And so he was pretty much given for dead or for dying. But then December 2010, Chisekedi decided that he was healthy enough and strong enough to come back home and run. So he arrives on December, uh, December 8th, I think, the same day the president was giving his State of the Nation speech. And everybody went to welcome Chisekedi. All the press went to Chisekedi. Nobody listened to what Kabila had to say. The next month, in panic, his majority in parliament changed the constitution within one week. So kind of the entire hellish process started from that thing. Now, what happened is that the international community, instead of condemning that act, very strongly look the other way. Um, since we're in America, our own US ambassador pretty much said this is an internal affair, we're not gonna get involved in it. But what that did really give Kabila, it was to give Kabila a tremendous power, tremendous advantage. One, he's an incumbent, like any other incumbent, so he had that power. He had access to uh, the state money. He had a very well organized coalition of various parties to work in his favor. So throughout, then the appointment of the Senate itself was very problematic. You had uh, seven commissioners, um, four from the majority and um, three of the opposition. But the head of the, the, uh, the commission is a very close friend of the president. Sometimes they say he's, uh, he's a relative of his, but for sure is spiritual father or spiritual advisor. So you can imagine when you appoint your godfather, your spiritual father to be the head of the election commission, he can only bless you. 
with victory, right? Um, and unfortunately, though, they didn't show the savvy that you need, even if you're going to steal the elections, you have to show some certain finesse. They refused to listen to the opposition. Uh, opposition the opposition had a lot of questions, a lot of demand. Namely, all of them were actually very sensical. Transparency in the list of uh, uh, the enroll, the enroll, the registered voters, so we can know who's actually real and who's fictive. Uh, they enrolled 32 million people, but it was said that a lot of those people, at least up to two millions of them, were either minors or dead or simply fiction. So uh, Seni refused to do that. They asked them to publish the map of all the polling stations so people can just get a sense, do we really have 63,000 polling stations or some of these are fiction, effective? Again, the Seni refused to do that. So the UDPS of Etienne Chiseke decided to march every Thursday in protest of this. Uh, that flared up the violence, but again, the international community kind of kept quiet. And uh, this went on for a long time until election day. So on election day, we saw a lot of those issues, and we'll talk about them more in Q&A, came up to the fore. Because on election day, as we showed up at the station, we found out that uh, one, there were thousands of people who showed up who did not at all, could, who could not find their names, meaning they had their voter, their uh, voter's card, but on the list it will say, no, your name is not here. And they say, well, what do you mean my name is not here? Here's my card. My card says I'm registered to vote at St. Christine. They say, no, 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 you've been delocalized. So probably you need to go find St. Mary's Girls School over there, and your name may be over there. And so a lot of people did this all day long just trying to find their name. And then you had stations where there were not enough ballots like at St. Boniface in Gili, just there were not enough ballots. So people rioted, eventually to vote the following day. So it had a lot of these issues that were issues that we all had flagged before that came to now bite us. So at this moment now we have a crisis where the elections were, the results were proclaimed, but you have Kabila claiming to be the winner. You also have Chisekedi claiming to be the winner. Kabila takes the off of office in the military camp, just take it, he takes the off office in his residence. Uh, as the civil society of, uh, a coalition of civil society in Virginia said, Congo is facing a two-headed leadership crisis. So that's where we are, and uh, my colleagues will complete the picture and we'll continue in the Q&A. Thank you very much. Thank you, Mbemba. Um, the three main points I'd like to make before I go into the sort of the, the, the details of the presentation are that much as Vemba pointed out, this was really the, a chronicle of an election mess foretold. Uh, it was an election mess, election wreck in slow motion to a certain extent. Everybody saw it coming. There were reports a year before the election saying that the election was going to be a relative mess. I think we were all extremely disappointed by how it turned out, but none of us were very surprised. So I think that um, it's a lesson to both people inside and in particular outside the country as well, that something could have been done and, and nothing was done. The second point I wanted to make is that the, even though the elections were rigged and there was a lot of fraud during the elections, the way that it was rigged and the kind of fraud that we saw um, also leads us to believe that there's a fragmentation, or the conclusion of this was a, is that there's a clear fragmentation of power within the presidential camp itself. And I'll talk more about that. Uh, so it's, it's misleading to say that Kabila just stole the election um, because there's a fragmentation within his own camp as well. Uh, and the third thing, and this is probably the most important thing and the most disheartening thing, is that we've been on a process of, we've been in a peace process in the Congo since, well, since uh, the, at the very latest uh, 2000, and, well, 1999, I guess you could say, with the Lusaka Agreement. <laughs> Um, they culminated in elections in 2006, and the peace process to a certain extent continued. Um, and people bought into this process. And I think these elections now mark a point where people no longer buy into the process. In other words, not only do we have a loss of legitimacy for the president, but the reaction by members of parliament and by the Congolese people itself is that they don't have faith in, a, in, in the process anymore. Um, we'll talk more about that as well. So I'm just going to pick up where Mbemba left off about what went wrong. We were both uh, in elec on election, uh, in the Congo on election day. I was in the east, he was in the west. Um, 
And many of these things you already pointed out. Um, there was a confusion about the voter register. Tens of thousands of people were disenfranchised because they didn't know where to go to vote. This happened across the country. It was particularly bad in Kinshasa. Um, then on election day, there were many allegations of ballot stuffing. Very often what happened is, is that um, somebody around the uh, polling station would see somebody pull up in a personal vehicle with a bunch of ballots that are pre-marked in favor of a certain candidate. This would then trigger protests. In several incidents, uh, people were mobbed, uh, lynched. Uh, in Kasai Occidental alone, 143 polling stations were burned down. I think this is actually a preliminary figure. I think far many more polling stations were burned down. Um, sometime, and there's a lot of paranoia um, and many, many rumors circling around as well. Um, security forces got interfered in the electoral process. This was particularly, this was by far the worst in the Kivu province, uh, North Kivu, uh, in the territory of Masisi, where CNDP soldiers, so soldiers uh, formerly loyal to Lohan Kunda and Bosco Tiganda, uh, not only got involved in elections, they would do things like tie people up, take their voting cards and go vote for them on a, on a relatively massive scale. Thankfully, um, the legislative elections there have been canceled, I think in part because fraud was so flagrant. Um, and then you had things like suspiciously high registration. So if you compare how many people registered in different territories between 2006 and 2011, um, there was a nationwide increase of 26%, which is relatively normal for the Congo. But in some places, it was 52%. And actually, in some places that voted overwhelmingly in favor of Joseph Kabila in particular, it was very high. So things like this um, made, people, made people's eyebrows go up, I guess you could say. Very, very high turnout in some places. So again, nationwide turnout was 58%. But in some places, in particular in Katanga, you had turnout of over 100%. Uh, in Malemba and Kulu, 99.46% of people voted, and every single one of them voted for Kabila. Um, uh, mathematically, almost, uh, Carter Center's conclusion was this is mathematically impossible. In Kabongo, again, we're talking 300,000 people voting. In Kabongo, the same thing. Um, during the compilation process, then after the voting, we had, as Mbemba already pointed out, 2 million ballot ballots just got lost. We don't know where they are. They were burnt, they were destroyed, uh, and we're never going to find out who those two million people voted for. Um, there was a, people were prevented access to the central database uh, of the electoral commission, so the compilation process was not transparent. And very poor, I mean, poor treatment, when I say poor treatment of data and material, this is a, a drastic understatement. You know, if you saw the FIKIN, the central compilation warehouse in Kinshasa, there would be bundles of ballots, you know, strewn around in the mud, people stepping on them, uh, people would find ballots in a warehouse someplace where they weren't supposed to be. Um, you had people belonging to uh, Kuluna, so local gangs in Kinshasa were given security uniforms and manned security in the Fikin, in the Central Compilation Center in Kinshasa. So, I mean, a complete violation of um, the transparency and integrity of the electoral, electoral process. So, in, in sort of final analysis, and we can get more into this in Q&A, um, obviously, as you know, Kabila was declared victor with 48 point some percent of the votes and Chisikedi 32 percent. Um, we don't know who won the election. I think it's very important to say that. We have, we really, we can't say. Uh, people, some of us have guesses or inclinations. They, they think they know, but even the Catholic Church, when the Catholic Church came out with its statement, the Catholic Church has been extremely caustic in its uh, denunciation of the election irregularities. Um, they said, we, we don't have evidence to say who won the election. And I think it's important we point that out. Um, but there was massive, massive fraud and massive irregularities, not only in the presidential election, but now as we've seen in the legislative election as well. Um, according to at least one source uh, in Kinshasa, 340 of the 500 seats are being contested. Uh, and that they're being currently contested in the Supreme Court. So enormous, enormous fraud, enormous regularities. Just uh, briefly, uh, to show you the map of, um, of, of how people voted, this of course with a huge caveat that the election results somehow approximate the truth, which is a big caveat to make, but uh, nonetheless I think it's interesting comparing, can you, oops, sorry, you can't, I've been flipping the wrong thing. Sorry, I've been flipping my computer. Can you see that? Um, so the, on the left is the depiction of how people voted this time, and on the right is just for Joseph Kabila in 2006. So the red is Joseph Kabila 2011, and the blue is Joseph Kabila 2006. 
Um, so it's largely speaking, he maintains his, um, his lead, his dominance across the country except for the Kivus, where unexpe I mean, expectedly he lost an enormous amount of popularity. Um, uh, Chisekedi was extremely popular in the Kasais and, and in Bakongo and parts of Equator. Kingo Adondo was very popular in, in a small, narrow part of Equator, and Vital Camara was popular in the narrow, sm small part of the Kivu. So as Vemba said, it really is becoming clear that the key thing was changing the Constitution. If you consider that there was massive fraud, that fraud could have made up hundreds of thousands, perhaps millions of votes. If the opposition candidates had been able to back one person, one candidate, they, had, they would have had a much better chance, if not a certainty, of having won the elections. This is sort of, it's not, it's very difficult to guess, as I said, because there's been so, many, so much fraud, but that's what is now slowly becoming clear. Um, these are the legislative results. This is a bit confusing. Sorry, again, I'm clicking the wrong thing. This is a bit confusing, but basically Kabila um, maintains his dominance in the National Assembly if, again, these results reflect the truth, which we know uh, they certainly don't entirely. Um, but one of the other things we notice is that where Kabila's uh, dominance in the National Assembly was based around a few, a, a, a smaller group of large parties in 2006, we have this drastic fragmentation of the political landscape and no one party commands more than 60 votes now out of a 500 seat assembly. So he's having to cobble together a coalition out of 100, not 100, 100 parties in the National Assembly. He's probably going to have to include 30, 40, 50 parties in his coalition which is going to be incredibly difficult to manage. And this is exactly the opposite of what Kabila was trying to aim for. If you talk to people around Kabila, they've been complaining for the last five years that to get any vote passed in the National Assembly, they have to bribe and co-opt people left and right. And it takes a long time and it takes a lot of money. Um, and they don't like this at all. And they wanted to change this and instead of changing it to consolidate their control, they have a greater fragmentation. But they still control the National Assembly. So what does this tell us? What, what's the analysis that we can, we can carry out? What did, if indeed uh, these results reflect something of the truth, and I do think they reflect something of the truth in terms of how things were voted, and if uh, our observations uh, were correct from what we saw on the grounds, then people voted out of three, for three reasons. Ideology, uh, so for example, in the Kivus, the reason people voted against Kabila is because Kabila promised them peace, and they certainly didn't get peace, they didn't get development. So I think you could say ideology, or if you want to, policy, they wanted security, they wanted development, and they didn't get it. So I think in many parts of the country, those factors certainly played a role. Um, ethnicity, there's no doubt that, eth that, that ethnicity um, played a uh, an important, if complicated, role. And there's both national and local cleavages. So if you look at the map that I showed you here, you can see the main cleavage is still an east-west cleavage with the, the large exception of Bandundu province here. And the third thing, and I think Bandundu is a great example of this, are local strongmen. So um, Bandundu is the Palu party, which is a close ally to Kabila's party, is extremely powerful in Palu. And what Kabila did before the, uh, sorry, in Bandundu province, what Kabila did before the election is he put, invested a lot of money and time in co-opting political parties, but also customary chiefs, priests, administrators, musicians. I think almost 99% of Congolese musicians brought out songs, campaign songs for Kabila which is uh, not hugely important, but you know, it just gives a good indication of how much he was trying to co-opt people around him and influence the vote. And Palu is a great example of that. You know, people uh, people in, uh, in the Palu party, which is strong in Bandundu, have a deep, uh, deep attachment to Antoine Gizenga, who is the head of Palu and sort of the patriarch of the region. And what he said really, really influenced people there. But Bandundu is also a good example of other things. So there's a deep antipathy amongst many people in Bandundu province, here again, against people from the Kasais, the Luba, here. And of course, the main opposition candidate was Chisikedi, and he was a Luba. So many people, some people I spoke to in Bandundu says, we didn't vote for Kabila, but we didn't want Chisikedi to come to power for various, for complicated reasons, some of which have to go back to the post-independence struggle where Gizenga and Chisikedi were deep enemies. 
uh, in the immediate post-independence phase, but also due to the fact that many of the trade routes that go from Kinshasa into Bandundu are run and managed by Luba traders. So there's local resentments as well, just to give you an idea about the different factors that played in here. Um, and then the last thing that Bandundu is a good example of is that in, a, in, in some, I think, relatively narrow areas, this, the, the, I think the, the, the small amount of infrastructure development that Kabila was able to bring about, in particular through his Chinese deal, made an, made an impact. So uh, Bandundu, for example, there's a large road that's been built that goes now from Kichasa almost all the way to Kasai. It certainly goes to Kikwit. Um, and uh, most of the country hasn't seen development, as uh, Bemba pointed out, but some certain areas of the country have. And I think that probably provided some, um, some support for Kabila as well. Um, so just to rush through, because now I'm, I'm going over time, um, the contestation, the, obviously there was a deep contestation and, un, and bitter contestation of the results, the international, almost all of the international observation missions condemned the Carter Center. I would recommend anybody who wants more information on uh, what exactly happens in terms of uh, election irregularities go to either the Carter Center or the European Union's mission statements. They gave a, a very comprehensive statement about all of the flaws and fraud that, that happened during elections. Um, the Catholic Church was extremely caustic, but and this is what is important to understand in terms of Kabila's mentality, almost every single African country congratulated him on the election results. Most importantly, South Africa, that sent the largest observation mission uh, of all the observation missions, the SADC observation mission, to Kinshasa, uh, and they congratulated Kabila on elections. Um, Uganda, Angola, North Korea, Vietnam, et cetera, et cetera. So, I mean, he, he doesn't feel, we may think that he's isolated, but from Kinshasa, the view looks slightly different. Um, Tony's going to talk more about the international reaction, so I'll skip that for the moment. There's been a, a, a terrible security crackdown uh, in Kinshasa, in particular in the, in the several weeks right after the elections. We don't know exactly how many people have been arrested, but my guess is hundreds. Um, we don't know exactly how many people have been killed, but certainly dozens. Chizikedi is under de facto house arrest. The government says he isn't, but he can't leave his house. Um, they block the roads off. Every time people try to demonstrate, they go in with tear gas and police, uh, and, and, and police and break up the protests, sometimes relatively brutally. Um, so in general, the UDPS has not been able, contestation has come from international actors and obviously through the press, but it has not come from the streets until now. In part, that's because of the brutal crackdown, and in part, I think it's also because the UDPS did not do a good job in preparing its own grassroots networks, including in Kinshasa. I think it took for granted what is true, which is that most people in Kinshasa support Chisikedi and the UDPS, but it didn't mobilize people and create the strong social networks that you need in order to put people out in the streets. Um, so I'm gonna stop there. We can get into the solutions at the end. Uh, I would just sort of like to flag now that I think that uh, we had a very, I think very interesting and unfortunately prickly conundrum, which is that the ideal situation is no longer feasible. The ideal situation, situation would just be to rehold the elections. The elections were, we're never going to know the real result of the elections, uh, and we should have just said, rehold the whole presidential election, rehold the whole legislative election. I think in an ideal world, that would have been, that would have been what should have been done. I, we'd love to hear from, from you, obviously, about what you think should be done. I don't think that that is any longer feasible, just because if you talk to diplomats, if you talk to people in Kinshasa, they look at you as if you're in la-la land if you start talking like that. Um, but I think there is uh, opportunity to rehold part, re part of the legislative election and to, to make to ensure that the, the rest of the electoral process is more successful. We have provincial elections coming up and local elections coming up, and those are very important as well. And finally, to use this, I, I think somewhat perversely and paradoxically, as an opportunity to re-engage in a more constructive fashion with Kabila government. So this should be a shock to the system, to donors, not just to keep on shoveling mo money towards Kinshasa and think everything's fine, but to say that this is an opportunity for us to rethink and to re-engage upon very clear principles and terms uh, of relations. So having first preached that everybody else stay within time, I've now gone over time. Only 17, James. No, he, Tsubemba went till 13 minutes, so I only went 14 minutes. <laughs> Competition. <laughs> Good afternoon, everybody, and thank you, Peter, for the nice introduction and for the opportunity to speak about this crucial issue. After 
Mbemba and Jason's remarks, I'm going to try very hard not to repeat anything that they went over, but to try to complement their remarks. I'm going to do three things. First, a short comment on why this crisis is important. Second, I want to discuss some issues surrounding the reporting of the results by the Electoral Commission, but with a tight focus on the issue of democratic legitimacy. Then finally, I will make some specific recommendations on what to do so that Congo can regain a democratic path. My first point, I want to stress something that's been said by many other individuals and groups. In addition to the mismanagement and irregularities, the November elections clearly were tainted by fraud. If anyone in this group has any questions about that, I strongly urge that you look again at what Jason just had to say, and if you have other questions, come and talk to him. There was fraud in these elections. The way in which the present crisis of democratic legitimacy that was created by this fraud is managed will affect every issue, every issue of interest to the United States. So let's just talk about it purely. We're in Washington from the standpoint of the United States government. How the Congo gets out or does not get out of this crisis will decide, of course, whether Congo can regain a democratic path. But also, it will have a determinative effect on what the US is trying to do relating to sexual and gender-based violence, broader respect for human rights, security sector reform, conflict minerals, general development pro prospects, all other issues. So even if you don't have a general interest in the Congo and you have one particular focus, I would argue you have to care about what comes out of this electoral crisis. And if it's not successfully resolved, it won't be possible, it will not be possible to improve governance in the Congo in meaningful ways, period. Furthermore, Congo could descend into a deeper humanitarian disaster, become unstable once again, affecting all of Central Africa and beyond. Surely, we don't want to see this. That is what at stake. Now to my second point on democratic legitimacy. Following what Mvemba had to say, let me go back to 2006. And Vemba and I were Carter Center observers in 2006, along with many other people. And I would say just flat out that in terms of what one was looking for, the elections in 2006 were relatively good, free, and fair. And after those elections, President Kabila himself stated that after legitimately winning, he finally became the democratically legitimate head of state. Kabila had governed since 2001. But he himself recognized that until there were democratic uh, elections, his source of legitimacy was questionable. It came through democratic elections. The international community correctly agreed. Now let me go to 2011 and read you a quote from about a year ago, last March. Here's my quote. <coughs> The 2011 national elections are an essential step in determining the Congo's democratic future. I repeat, an essential step in determining the Congo's democratic future. The legitimacy of the Congo's next president and parliament will be determined by the quality of the upcoming election. We encourage elections that are well and transparently administered and that are conducted in an environment conducive to free political expression. That wasn't Mvemba, wasn't me, wasn't Jason. That was the United States State Department. That's a State Department quote from last March. Now let me give you a statement on the outcome of the elections made by actually the same State Department official about two weeks ago. Quote, it is important to note that we do not know, and it might not be possible to determine with any certainty whether the final order of presidential candidates would have been different from the final results had the management of the process been better. Let's focus on this statement a little bit and very much have in mind what Jason had to say when he said flat out the truth. We don't know and no one can know right now who won 
the presidential election. You just can't know. Now, just if you were being logical, you knew nothing else, you knew the first statement I read to you from about a year ago, and this next one, wouldn't you think that the implication of the second statement I read would be, well, we have to find out who won, because democracy requires that citizens accept that their process has produced a democratically legitimate winner, and we don't have that yet. But as Jason intimated, and I really want to underscore that this is shocking, some Western diplomats turn this logic upside down. In private, what they will suggest is that since there isn't definitive proof that Kabila lost, we might as well accept that he won. Think about that a little bit. Think about that. That assertion is purely and simply illogical nonsense. It's purely illogical. And let's take, I want to focus on this a little bit and really try to nail why it's so important. Despite all the imperfections of the 2006 elections, the Carter Center concluded, and I said I was part of that and I strongly endorsed this finding, that President Kabila actually won at the end of the day. Yes, there was cheating and fraud on a large scale in 2006 by both Kabila and by, in the second round, his opponent Jean-Pierre Bemba. But the Carter Center examined the levels of cheating and determined that the results still were accurate in terms of who won and who lost. You can get the Carter Center's reports on the 2006 elections on the internet. You can read the details. In 2011, Western diplomats agree the elections were managed so badly, now diplomats carefully avoid using the term fraud, but they say they were managed so badly, it's not clear who won but then in this logic that I just referred to, they argue that the results as stated have to stand unless it can be proven that the results aren't accurate. That's the wrong way to think about this. Let's talk about the right way to think about it. Let's go back to what the State Department said a year ago. The legitimacy of the Congo's next president and parliament will be determined by the quality of the upcoming election, a quote. This is a good statement. So what is the legitimacy of the announced president, Joseph Kabila, after these elections? Given, as Jason said, that it's possible, I don't know, you can't know, but it is possible that the man, the man announced as president actually lost the election, that's possible. But let's also talk about what we know. Two months after the election, we know that he and his supporters engaged in systematic fraud so that he would be declared the winner. So I'd argue that actually the only logical conclusion that one can reach based on the evidence is that as of today, Joseph Kabila is not the democratically legitimate head of the Congolese state. Just using the criterion that I quoted from a State Department official from a year ago. The US government and other Western states, frankly, have not yet digested what it means that the sitting head of the Congolese state has just organized a massive effort across multiple provinces to fraudulently alter and manipulate election results. Yet. By their own public statements, he should be denied the democratic legitimacy that he received in 2006. And as my colleagues have mentioned, he should begin to feel specific negative consequences for this attempted theft. Now let me go back to the Department of State because Secretary of State Clinton had some very helpful and important things to say in a statement released on December 20th. This is what she said and compare this to the quote that I, the second, the first and second quotes I read you earlier from other State Department officials. The Secretary of State said, I quote, it is still not clear, she's talking about the presidential election, it is still not clear whether the irregular, irregularities were sufficient to change the outcome of the election. 
It's rather sim- similar to the second statement. But then, this is the suggestion she makes. She suggests a review of the electoral process by Congolese authorities and outside experts to shed additional light on the cause of the irregularities, identify ways to provide more credible results, and offer guidance for the ongoing election results. This is what Secretary Clinton said on December 20th. The National Democratic Institute and IFAS sent a mission to the Congo in early January to try to do this, but fundamentally because of lack of cooperation by the Congolese Electoral Commission, this mission ended in failure. I'm going to come back to Secretary Clinton's recommendation at the end of my comments. I want to make one more quick point on the uncertainty of the results. There's a method that should have been used in the Congo that would have avoided this problem, and that is to have had a parallel vote count. This was used to great effect in Ivory Coast, and I would argue that this tool should be used as a matter of course in all elections in countries like the Congo where we know that these problems exist. As Jason said, this was a crisis in slow motion. Many people saw it coming for a long time. A, a very powerful tool that is, that is now in the international community's toolbox, parallel vote count, was not used in the Congo. I see today in the audience friends from the State Department, USAID, and the National Endowment for Democracy. And I just want to emphasize, you know this, this isn't hard to do. It's not particularly expensive. And we knew about this tool. And so there was a conscious decision not to fund a parallel vote count in the Congo. I guess that's what's called a sin of omission. Um, so where do we go from here? I want to focus on some recommendations that were made in a letter sent by seven major European and American NGOs last week. They sent this letter to UN and Western diplomats. Their first point was that, I quote, permitting these election results to stand without serious attempts to rectify them or to correct the process that led to the flaws will be a serious blow to building democracy in the Congo and is likely to lead to instability. Then they make four recommendations. Number one, any solution must be based on respect for democratic principles. In other words, an easy slide into some sort of new government based on these fraudulent results is not good enough. You have to find some way to raise the bar and find some respect for democratic principles. Second, thoroughly reform the Congolese Electoral Commission. And Let's note that this Electoral Commission really doesn't have any credibility anymore. And for it to regain that credibility, it has to be reconstituted. It needs new membership. Those need to be universally respected members. And the representation needs to be made more equitable. These are all recommendations that have been made by, among others, the Catholic bishops of the Congo. Third, strongly and publicly condemn attacks by security services to suppress citizens' rights and demand accountability. Jason has already talked about this and how serious uh, a problem this has been. Um, and then finally, support the right to peaceful protest. You may have noticed and had a little question. Still up? Still up here? Yeah. Down here, Jason has put February 16th a question mark, but because he was running out of time, he didn't say anything about February 16th. That's tomorrow. Congolese civil society has been deeply engaged in the electoral process, and the Catholic Church of Kinshasa has scheduled a march for tomorrow to call for justice, democratically legitimate institutions, and to commemorate a so-called March of Christians that was held on the same date in 1992 when President Mobutu was still in power. And on that date, President Mobutu's troops attacked the unarmed marchers killing and wounding dozens of them. The international community, this letter said last week, should reiterate both publicly and privately to Congolese government authorities that the right to assemble is a fundamental right enshrined in the Congolese constitution and urge Congolese authorities not to use force to impede peaceful protests. 
I am delighted to be able to say that yesterday there was another statement that came out of the State Department. So we have had some extremely positive statements from the State Department since the elections. The December 20th statement by Secretary Clinton, now a statement from yesterday by the State Department spokesperson, Victoria Nuland. You can find it on the state website. It's called Ongoing Electoral Process in the Democratic Republic of the Congo. The key sentences relating to the march tomorrow say this. We remain deeply concerned about multiple allegations of human rights abuses by security forces, including illegal and arbitrary detentions throughout the electoral process. The Congolese government should fully investigate such reports, hold anyone found responsible fully accountable, and take concrete steps to ensure that security forces exercise restraint and respect people's rights of assembly and of peaceful protest, said from the podium by the State Department spokesperson yesterday. So if we get this new electoral commission, what should it do? That's what I'll end with. Two specific tasks. First, as Jason said, we have provincial elections that have to come next. They have to be organized credibly. They really have to meet minimum standards for a decent election. And for those of you who aren't steeped in the Congo, it's something of a misnomer almost to call them the provincial elections because the provincial assemblies elect senators. So you get a national outcome from the provincial elections. So they're very important that way. The provincial assemblies also elect the regional governors. The second thing that should happen, though, this is kind of looking forward, the first organized credible provincial elections. The second, look backward. Examine the results of the November 28th elections with a view to establishing actual winners and losers. And in those instances, presidential and legislative, where winners and losers can't be clearly established, those elections should be revoted at the same time as the provincial elections. Provincial elections should be delayed. They were supposed to be held next month. They're obviously not going to be held next month. As of now, they've just been postponed indefinitely. It's pretty clear technically they can't be held with any credibility before late this year or more likely early next year. And let me make one clear recommendation. It's a lot better to delay these elections and get them right than to rush to early provincial elections and botch them, as happened with the November national elections. Now let me emphasize, all these recommendations are completely consistent with Secretary Clinton's statement and multiple statements already made by Congolese actors. And if taken, would go a long way to correcting the multiple errors and fraud that destroyed the credibility of the November elections. If this would happen, the Congo will have found its way back onto a democratic path that's essential for long-term stability and progress. Helping Congolese find a way back to democratic legitimacy has to be the international community's focus. Thanks. Thanks to all three of our speakers for a very cogent summary of the conduct and the events surrounding the elections, the experience of observers, the interplay of international and domestic forces, uh, and the aftermath of the electoral uh, event, uh, as John Campbell has said, with respect to uh, Nigeria, an election-like event. Uh, which transpired in uh, DRC in November. Um, I'm going to start by adding a couple of questions to the mix and then taking a couple from the floor. And in, as our usual practice, uh, we'll take them in, in groups. Um, my two questions are, what should this mean? Not what will it mean, but what should this mean for US DRC relations? What would be the appropriate stance uh, going forward? Uh, given, if the current dispensation stands, 
uh, and the elections are not revisited. There's not a revision of the process. There are no forensics uh, or revotes, and uh, President Kabila simply uh, claims a mandate. And then the second question is uh, less prescriptive, more analytical. How would each of you uh, see the prospects for stability and security? What would be your expectation about the situation in the East, uh, about a potential continuing protests and dissent in Kinshasa? And what would the uh, political process look like? So taking the, the chair's prerogative, those are my starter questions. But uh, why don't we take a few from the floor? Yeah. And just please identify yourself. Do we have a microphone? I think we do. Anyway, we go ahead. Each other now. Through the, through the film. Yeah. We, we, won't, we won't make you walk over and stand next to the microphone. <laughs> There we go. Uh, <clears throat> Dave Peterson, National Endowment for Democracy. Um, uh, a, a couple uh, observations and then a, a question. Um, you know, in, in terms of, um, you know, the uh, conduct of the elections, uh, I uh, had the opportunity to observe in Kinshasa, and so, uh, you know, I uh, admit to a sort of uh, a Western perspective on it, but. In Kinshasa, at least, uh, the elections themselves looked like they were reasonably well organized. Uh, you know, I mean, despite the problem with the registration list, um, you know, it uh, was surprisingly uh, uh, orderly in Kinshasa. And so, you know, uh, there were a lot of these sort of predictions beforehand that, oh, we need more time, uh, you know, to get the logistics together. Uh, my sense was that you could have had another year and it wouldn't have made any difference in the outcome of the election. Uh, you know, the problem with the election wasn't uh, mismanagement, it was, uh, you know, pure fraud. I mean, uh, I uh, am interested, there were, after, in the week after the elections, there were a lot of results that were floating around. Um, you know, these sort of happened to correspond with uh, some of the reports that we were getting from the civil society organizations about, you know, uh, what they were seeing. Uh, and those uh, you know, sort of uh, independent results uh, certainly would, I think, lead to a very different analysis of exactly what was happening in the elections. I mean, in terms of the uh, ethnic questions, et cetera, it seemed like uh, you know, that there was a lot of uh, cross-cutting and uh, so that uh, you know, I, I questioned some of the analysis about um, the results of the elections to the, you know, to the extent that they're being based on the official uh, uh, results. <clears throat> Um, and, and, and so this also goes to, you know, any rerun of the elections, uh, what is going to prevent them from being the same, uh, you know, exercise in fraud all over again? Uh, you know, if, plus it's going to be a very expensive exercise uh, anyway. Is the international community likely to foot the bill, you know, for a second set of elections? <clears throat> um, you know, I, I found it very interesting um, uh, just yesterday that evidently Bob Zolik uh, uh, has said that the World Bank is going to you know, not be providing uh, uh, budgetary support uh, to DRC. I don't know if you know, that has been confirmed, but that would seem to me to be a very uh, sort of uh, logical thing uh, for the United States to uh, endorse. Uh, and perhaps it's already uh, a part of American policy now you know, that uh, uh, aid be suspended, but uh, it would seem to me that um, the less legitimacy the international community confers on uh, this uh, government, um, uh, the uh, better possibility that uh, it will be, it will feel pressure to uh, get serious about some reform. So this is a very, I think, pointed question about whether we're looking at disarray, mismanagement, or systemic fraud. I also, in my shorthand, as I'm taking notes, uh, and you're talking about budget support, I put down BS. So maybe there's something, uh, maybe there's something there. Tony Carroll, Manchester Trade, and I sometimes teach here. Um, okay, so what does it all mean? What are, what are the implications for U.S. foreign policy um, and U.S. economic interests in the Congo? Uh, I, I think the, uh, the answer is uh, they may not care whether we're interested in, in endorsing their elections. They have many other suitors 
from an economic and political standpoint that are beating a path to their door. And while we can argue, for, as we're to a certain extent, at least in the eyes of some Congolese, uh, indefinitely about how many angels can fit on the head of a pin and whether or not election you know, fraud uh, it occurred or not, the fact is that people are going to move on and that the business community and other suitors, and we know who the, some of those suitors are, are going to be, in effect, filling the vacuum that we, that we leave. So from a very sort of hardened economic perspective, uh, imperfect as they might be, is the option for the U.S. government and business to move ahead and maybe hope that it's better the next time around, applying some of the lessons that we learned, or that we choose the path uh, that has been suggested that we, in effect, um, uh, put up a roadblock and say, no, we're not going to move anywhere in the Congo and not allow any business to occur uh, unless we have a remedy for the situation. Okay. And I'll take one last one here, and then we'll do the next round. Oops. Okay, thank you. Uh, my name is Paul Ndiho. Uh, let me start off. Uh, I'll have uh, three questions for all of you, one each. Uh, let me start uh, with Vemba. Uh, Vemba, you made, uh, at uh, the beginning of your statement, uh, you made uh, reference to this. Uh, maybe let me repeat it. Uh, you said that uh, it doesn't matter uh, how many people show up to vote in an election, but what matters is who counts the votes. I wonder how much of that uh, uh, play, uh, what, how, how big a role that played into the election. And uh, uh, Tony, you talked about uh, these uh, recommendations, uh, but to me it sounds more like the rhetoric that uh, we hear all the time. I was wondering if uh, there is any backing to that. Uh, is the international community going to maybe follow up with sanctions or something? Mm -hmm. And uh, 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 Jason, you talked about uh, how in some areas there is a semblance of peace, uh, development, uh, you know. Uh, I wonder if that also played a big role in determining who uh, was elected as president in the Congo. Thank you. Okay, thanks. So we had three questions, which actually turned out to be three quick questions. Everybody should take note at <laughs> future events, a model of uh, economy. Okay, why don't we turn over this cluster of questions to, to our panel, and then we'll, we'll have time for another round. Okay, uh, we yeah. kind of just pick... Uh, pick a question, okay. any question. And okay, I'll, I'll, I'll take a stab at what... Um, at Dave Peterson's question. Um, it is true that in Ken, I was in Ken, that one, you sense that there was a serious commitment on the part of the population people showing up at 5.30, women with babies, and then being told to go here and go there until the end of the day. Um, you also saw people at six to, a quarter to six, people almost in tears, asking you if you could do something, just something so they could vote. And you see a six-year-old man almost crying. Because people believe international observers had some kind of power to make things happen, and we could not. So on one level, I agree with you that with the current CENI, whether we had a year or less, I'm not sure if things would have been different. But I think if we had had more time, then hopefully we would have heard more of the noise that the opposition was making. More time would have given us a chance to review the server, hopefully. I mean, of course, we're looking back. Review the server, review the voter registry. If more time would have given us that kind of common sense, then we would have saved more of the process. Because in reality, the same question that we were talking about before the elections are the same question now that are coming home to roost, except with more consequences, much more violence and, and so on and so forth. Um, so that's what I say. And in that sense, I do. Uh, and then as far as the bill to rerun the elections, I think there's, a, there's this mistake that the international community funded the elections. It is also true that 85% of the election were funded by the Congolese. Uh, which is true. So we, lost, we lose that often when we talk about who funded these elections. In fact, part of the disappointment of the elections is that it could have been a good moment for pride to, for the Congolese. Here's a country that sometimes people call failed states or weak, whatever it is. There are not many failed states who fund 85% of $700 million election. Um, so if there's a rerun, then maybe this is the chance to actually for the international community to come in and, and fund, since they didn't do it the first time around. Um, uh, just that. 
Okay. Yeah. Shall I get into it? I'm going to surf over some of these questions. Um, first, let me um, say a little bit uh, relating to Dave's question, just because Mvemba started with that. Uh, Dave, don't forget that it's not just uh, about the fraud, it's about who committed the fraud. And as Mvemba was saying, when much of your fraud is coming directly from your electoral commission, you got a hell of a problem. Now, the problem is, as Jason suggested, People knew that this was happening long before the election. It wasn't, oh, we're shocked afterwards. Something had to be done by the Electoral Commission then. Something must be done by the Electoral Commission now. That's why I start with that recommendation. If you don't change the Electoral Commission, then your statement is absolutely right. Of course, you can't have any. But I would say, and you know this, Dave, in 2006, you had a relatively good Electoral Commission. So yes, you had fraud, but it was coming from other sources. But at the center, you had a Congolese source that was trying to hold things together and do things right. And things went much better on those circumstances. There's this weird fiction circulating in Washington and elsewhere. The 2006 went really well because the international community did everything. It's really very insulting to the Congolese. Oh, the international community handled 2006. That's why it went well. We let the Congolese handle it in 2011, and of course, they screwed it up. That's what you hear from people. That's just factually wrong. In 2006, the Congolese played an incredibly important role in organizing and executing their own elections in an extremely impressive way. The same could have happened in 2011 if some of those changes were made. And that I still am optimistic. In terms of the cost, the cost issue is a red herring. It's a red herring because all of us are talking about doing this in the context of provincial elections. Everyone in the international community agrees now that good provincial elections need to be held, so they say, it means they have to be paid for. So that implies some role for the international community, including financing. So raising the financial, and anything that I've called for or others in terms of adding revoting does not add substantially to the, the cost of organizing. So that becomes a red herring issue. Um, now, on Peter's first question, um, you know, just the, the negative part, if everything goes bad and we don't get any uh, response, then yes, uh, and I'll, I'll come to Tony's point too, so this is sort of coming to your question a little bit backwards. Yeah, the appropriate stance is to say that uh, there are consequences for uh, running a fraudulent election and uh, those should include a re-examination of all donor flows, in particular the important ones that come from the international financial institutions. So I would endorse what Bank President Zelik said the other day. That's confirmed, by the way. That is a, a bank view. Um, I would think it's very important to look at international monetary fund flows. They, if you look at what Western donors provide, mainly from the World Bank and the IMF, it's well over half of Congo's budget. So anyone's, anyone who's, any, who suggests that the West has no influence, that we can't do anything, they're just blowing smoke. It's wrong. If we want to have influence, we can have influence. And frankly, we do have influence. Uh, so I would do that. There are other things that you see people who are thinking about this suggesting. And it comes from the basket of things that people use as you go down a road of really trying to convince a government that we're very unhappy. You could have selective travel sanctions. You could, and I would look at all of those as you really try to make the case that the United States and others, because of course one would try to do this in a coordinated fashion with other states. Um, that lets me say just a sentence about your question about is this just rhetoric? We don't know. I tried to say in my comments that we've had some statements out of the US government that are not entirely consistent. Some very good ones, some that are a little puzzling, a little hard to read. Will there be a push to move in this direction, which is sort of implied in some of the things that Secretary Clinton is saying? Don't know. So I think that's the best answer I can give to that. But people who suggest that it's all over and that anyone pushing for these things uh, doesn't understand the, that it's all cynical and it's just all really doesn't understand the dynamic, at least within the American government, where there are, frankly, arguments about what should be the proper approach to the Congo. 
then to Tony's question. Um, this is a much longer discussion, Tony, uh, but I think we just disagree very strongly on your uh, premises. I don't think there are many other suitors, first of all. I think that's a false premise, that China is going to come out with all their money. I think if you look at what the Chinese are doing today, it doesn't really wash. That there are others there, the Indians, the South Koreans, I'm pretty familiar with that, doesn't really wash. Um, so it does come back to big Western actors. That sliding in and accepting the kind of election that Jason and Vemba described so well is the hard option. I'd actually argue that that's the soft option because everyone, including business actors, as you know, laments the lack of good governance in the Congo. Not because good governance is a pretty thing that we like to see in a nice world the day after Valentine's Day. It's because a business person to do their work doesn't want to have to spend a year and a half bribing people to get a contract and then a year and a half to move traffic down crappy roads to try to get from place A to B. It's hard logic of trying to make a buck doing work and everybody knows that the Congo is at the bottom of the list in the world today and so businesses stay away. A few, a very small number of major actors have gone in. But there, as you know better than me, there are tons of extremely major actors sitting on the sidelines. Why? Because the governance isn't good enough. Now, I challenge you or anybody to, and I'll listen very patiently for as long as you want to take, to tell me how, if you accept these results, we're going to get better governance over the next five years. But then I'd ask you to listen to me afterwards when I will share Pontificate. that... <laughs> You know, we don't have good governance now, and it's going to get a lot worse, and that's bad for business. So from your own standpoint, you should be looking for an outcome that gets you to the possibilities of improved governance, and, and, and that's the angle that then affects the, the, the specific concerns that the business community and others have. Let me address uh, Peter's uh, second question about stability and security. And I think uh, Bemba put it very eloquently. To a certain extent, um, it looks like everybody's in a holding pattern. I don't see uh, major donors um, are, have condemned their regularities. They are not willing to do much more than that. Uh, and slowly but surely, and this is sort of, I guess, what uh, Dave's point, they're not um, um, Oh, the government's banned tomorrow's march. Apparently. Oh. Okay. Well, that's uh, that's, big that's news. another that's another piece of big news. Anyway, to uh, Dave's point, the donors have not followed the bank's lead. In fact, I think they've already begun to release begun to release uh, chunks of aid that were blocked up before the elections. Uh, the, I thought it was very interesting that the Organisation de la Francophonie, so the Frank, something that we're not terribly interested here in the United States, but. It's very important, and the, the Francophone sphere has confirmed that the international summit of the Francophonie will take place in Kinshasa later this year, and they've dismissed criticism about the elections. So um, anyway, this is to say that the holding pattern amongst donors is there, and the only thing you hear in capitals is that, well, the one thing that could change things if the Cong Congolese could mobilize. If we see, in other words, to, if this march had taken place tomorrow in Kinshasa, if we see 50,000, 100,000 people in the streets of Kinshasa, Kabila opens up fire, 300 people die, that would change things. So it's as Bemba said, it's almost as if we're asking Congolese, you know, that you have the initiative, but we're not going to do anything else. And the initiative that they're supposed to take is, um, is not, would not necessarily have uh, good consequences. Um, so getting around to the question about stability versus security, I don't think, even though the, the ball to a certain extent is in the court of the Congolese, I don't think um, that, uh, well, at least until now, the UDPS has not shown that it's able to mobilize in, uh, in despite or despite the repression of the Congolese government. In fact, there's been very little mobilization since the election. There's been a lot of repression. There's been a lot of tear gassing, a lot of beating down. Um, and in, in, as I said before, I think the UDPS has shown that it is unable um, uh, unable to mobilize uh, uh, enough people uh, in face of that repression. I think one thing that would have happened, and it's important to point this out just because it's part of the dynamic, if Kabila had lost the election, there would have been 
uh, without any doubt, there would have been a lot of instability. This is uh, one of the reasons that I think some donors are happy that Kabila won the elections. This, in addition to the fact, and we did point this out, that many donors have a deep personal dislike for Chisake, which obviously should not have played uh, a role in anybody's judgment of the elections, but did, quite frankly, the American government in particular, there are officials in the American government who hate Chisake. And therefore, they're willing to look the other way when election results come in. Um, but if elections had gone in Chisikedi's favor, for example, or in Khmer's favor, but let's say Chisikedi's favor, uh, there is no doubt that there would have been trouble in the Kivus. The CNDP, um, several other armed groups in the Eastern Congo, the FRF, uh, Pareko, uh, for reasons we can get into, were deeply opposed to Chisikedi despite their problems with Kabila, deeply opposed to Chisikedi, and they have a lot, a lot of vested interest in the current regime, and they're almost certain to have rebelled. So I think none of the armed groups that currently exist in the Eastern Congo or any uh, larger social groups that could create trouble are, are affiliated to the opposition candidates who lost. And therefore, outside of the UDPS militants in Kinshasa and in the Kasais to a certain extent, um, there's nobody really who's going to cause an enormous amount of instability that I, I can see in, in the future. The problem is the one that, that Tony pointed out. The problem is the larger instability, which is this country that has deeply flawed and weak institutions, and that it itself is perhaps the greatest threat to instability, or to stability rather, the greatest threat to the local population. So it's much more of an insidious, I think, nuanced sort of instability that you need to look at. Um, now, uh, just briefly on, and we can talk, Dave, about this uh, afterwards. When I meant tribal, I didn't mean uh, it was Eastern versus Westerners. So very obviously, it wasn't, wasn't just that, although I think there is, a, that dynamic is certainly there. Um, but it is clear that if you look at the fact that the Kivus voted, large parts of the Kivus voted for Khmeri, large parts of Equator voted for uh, Kingo, um, uh, all of Katanga voted for Kabila, that ethnicity did play a role to a certain extent. It wasn't the only factor by any means stretch of the imagination. You know, weird things, like in South Kivu where I was, Khmer is a Xi candidate. Um, and there are problems between the Shi community, which is an ethnic community in South Kivu, and other communities such as the Rega community in South Kivu. And even though the Rega have suffered tremendously due to insecurity over the last five years, and many of them really don't like Kabila, a huge consideration was the fact is we can't vote for a Shi. And so, you know, we don't really know Chisikedi, we can't vote for a Shi, and therefore we vote for Kabila. So there's a bit there's, uh, there's both local and as well as national ethnic dynamics going on. It wasn't the only thing by any, any stretch of the imagination. We need to be very careful with any argument that's based on tri tribal, uh, on tribes or ethnicities. Um, but I think it was definitely there. Um, let's see, what else was I going to talk about? The, I, I agree with um, most of what Tony said about aid. I think that, um, I think it's, it's if I were, if I had to make a, a policy brief to the State Department, which I'm not currently doing, but I think it's important to point out what we're doing, what, I, what we would be asking for, I think, is we're, I think we're more or less all on the same page on this, and what we're not asking for them to do. We're not asking them to say Kabila's not the democratically elected president. We're not asking them to say, throw out these elections and redo an, a, new, a new election. We're asking for something that's much more feasible, which is for having um, closely scrutinizing legislative elections, which is what uh, Secretary of State Clinton already asked for, um, having getting a new election commission in place, and I think then above all re-engaging upon more solid principles with the Congolese government. So in other words, nothing that we're asking here currently would say that Kabila would be invalidated as president. Um, I think what's very important to point out is that one of the reasons we're in this situation is that there has been a donor drift over the last five years, and donors are much more fragmented um, and much less coordinated than they were in 2006. Um, and it's very important that we get the donors get back together. I mean, donors play an enormous role. You, they can't say, they can't provide 55% of the Congolese budget and then say, we don't have a role in Congolese affairs. It would be hypocritical to do that. And yet, that's more or less what's happened. I mean, the current attitude towards the Congo is we throw a lot of money at the Congo. The U U.S. government alone spends, and this is U.S. government estimates, over a billion dollars, and I think it's actually quite a bit over a billion dollars if you factor in peacekeeping and WFP and humanitarian aid and all these other things, and bank and IMF. Mm -hmm. um, it's probably quite a bit over a billion dollars a yeah. year, and yet there's not even a fraction of the, same, of the political will um, uh, engagement 
that, go, that goes together with that. So we throw money at the problem, but we don't engage at the same time with a commensurate amount of political will. So just to briefly go back to 2006, after the elections, there was donors who were very coordinated up until 2006 through the SEAT mechanism, for all of its flaws, came up with this thing called the Governance Compacts in 2006, which was you know, spearheaded by the World Bank and UNDP, um, which was, I think, provided a very solid basis for engagement with the Congolese government. It had the buy-in from the Congolese government. In fact, it had not only had the buy-in from the Congolese government, basically the same document was taken by Prime Minister Kizenga, submitted to the National Assembly, and then approved as his government plan. And it was pretty much exactly the same thing that donors had given them. And it had security sector reform, governance reform, uh, decentralization. It had all of the big uh, institutional reform headlights, uh, highlights were in this plan. Um, unfortunately, there was no follow-up done of this. And as soon as Kabila and the government started deviating from this plan, nobody really kicked up too much of a fuss. So I think that what I'm trying to say is that besides just going back and doing what Tony said, reviewing the legislative elections and and trying to make sure the provincial and local elections uh, are better, that what we really need to do as well is to think about the bigger picture here. It would be nice if there could be some reflection um, because of these events um, to realize that one of the reasons we were able to end up here is because people aren't coordinated anymore. And there's now a, this huge divergence between amount of money given and actual amount of attention and political attention given to developments in, in the Congo. So this is in response to the question about suspension of aid. I don't think that any of us is calling for an immediate suspension of aid, but I think we're calling for uh, very clear principles in going forward with the Congolese government about what, we, what donors think is acceptable or not. And if the Congolese government, you know, don't want to play ball with that, then that's, you know, their right not to play ball with that. But then it's hypocritical for donors then to provide uh, a total of three and a half billion dollars in aid a year, more or less, through various channels, of course, to the Congolese government. I just want to uh, respond to Paul. I don't know if I said, I don't think I said what you, the way you phrased your question, but if I get the gist of it, I personally believe, look, in 2006, the Congolese were promised all kinds of things. They told them, accept this flawed system, we'll deal with it later, things will be in place. Uh, 2011 came, the Congolese actually mobilized, and we totally disregarded the process. That's the problem. Uh, the least the international community can do is to back the Congolese in the respect of the electoral process. There is no point of having elections if you feel uncomfortable for various reasons, like Tony and that Jason have mentioned. We're not sure who's going to win. We're not sure what the East is going to do. No, have the election. Let the people vote. Support the process. If Chisekedi wins and the people in the East don't like him, let's see what happens. Because after all, Congo is not just the East. So if CNDP and my my so and so, my my X and Y raise a fuss, but Chisekedi has the full support of the rest of the country, then what? How long will these people sustain the rebellion? We don't know that because we never got a chance, right? But I also um, just want to say, as far as security, We've, we've had the Kabila regime for 11 years. So it's, it's always baffling when we talk about it like we just discovered Kabila yesterday. No, there is a track record, and that track record speaks for itself. As far as the Congolese are concerned, the Congolese said, we want change, we want to try something else. And we have denied the Congolese the opportunity to try that something else. That is the heart of the matter. So we've thrown out principles, we've thrown out ideals, um, we've been fumbling through all kind of uh, semantics when in fact uh, the problem is one, we have not stood by the Congolese people to bring about change. Thanks. Tony, did you have something? Yeah. Um, is, is this confirmed? Is this report confirmed? Okay. I, I just want to comment. There is a, a thank you so much because this is uh, big news. Apparently, the Congolese government uh, has just banned tomorrow's march, which is very significant. And it comes back to the question about rhetoric versus reality. You know, now we have a strong statement by, among others, 
the U.S. State Department saying, you must, I quote, respect people's rights of assembly and peaceful protest. And then you have the Congolese government saying, we don't care. We don't care. You can say what you want. Now, if you follow State Department statements, you will see that the statements regularly say to various countries, you must do X, Y, and Z. And quite regularly, those countries ignore that advice. And then the question is, what do we do about it? And the answer is, it depends. In a lot of, the, in a lot of countries, we do nothing. We keep saying, you must do this, you must do that. The country ignores us, and it just is rhetorical. It has really no effect on what's happening in, in the country. But there are some places where actually these statements are actually meant. And so when a country says, we don't care what the spokesperson said on February 14th, we're going to ban the march, then the US government and others will come back and say, actually, this is important to us, and here are some consequences. This is, this is what we mean, along the lines of what we've just been talking about. Um, so uh, with this story apparently confirmed, uh, your question becomes that much more relevant, that we have you know, very specific statement by the United States government. I'm not aware of any other government that made as strong a statement as the US government did, but I do know that other Western governments certainly would agree with the sentiments uh, uh, made in the spokesperson's uh, statement yesterday. So then the question becomes, is there a reaction? Or, as Jason said, you know, d d do people just back away and just say, well, OK, we'll see. But uh, you know, I, I take the time to talk about it now just to underscore for everyone here today that this is extraordinarily significant. We have hit. This march has been seen by a variety of people in the Congo and around the world in the way that Jason described it as a moment to either show that there was substantial popular dismay with the elections and desire to do something about it, or that there was not, that, that, people, that people were moving on. And if the Congolese people are moving on, then I'd be much more sympathetic with the comments that, uh, that came up in the, in the Q&A period. Um, but I think it's uh, fairly clear that if a government bans a march like this, that one would hope for swift, rapid, universal condemnation uh, by the United States and Western countries uh, that, go beyond, that goes beyond rhetoric. OK, I'm going to have to let that be the last word. Oh, you found it. Uh, no, this you conversation found it. has uh, very decisively focused on the policy implications of what occurred uh, during the elections and in the aftermath. Not much controversy on the verdict uh, about the conduct and the context of the elections, uh, but quite a number of questions about what kind of leverage we have in these situations, how we exert that leverage, whether or not we're abdicating any uh, opportunities for influence in this situation. I really want to thank all three of you for uh, taking the time to be with us today and continuing the conversation, and uh, I'm sure we'll do this again. Thank you very much. Yeah, well, yes. Uh,